Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, good afternoon for those of who you are joining us uh, from the UK. On behalf of the International Relations Committee of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, I warmly welcome you to today's webinar on pathological arbitration agreements, curing imperfect arbitration clauses. Before we proceed to our main agenda item of the day, I have a few <clears throat> messages to pass on. If you have any questions or queries, please do send them in through the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Your questions will be answered at the question and answer session um, in the latter half of the program by the speaker himself. Let me now turn towards the guest speaker. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome our guest speaker for today, Professor Gary Bond, who needs no introduction to, this, to those who are in the field of international arbitration. Professor Gary Bond is the chair of the International Arbitration Group at Wilmer Cutler Pickering Hale and Doe LLP. Such a poetic name, I must say. He has served as a counsel in over 675 arbitrations, including several of the largest arbitrations in ICC and ad hoc history, and has sat as the arbitrator in more than 250 international and ad hoc arbitrations. If you may, some of his lectures, submissions as a lead counsel are available on internet on the SIAC uh, website and Walter's Brewer website. In, even simply, if you go to YouTube, you will find uh, many of his uh, uh, lectures and uh, so on and so forth. Especially, I must mention, uh, last week I was watching uh, your great submissions uh, in the Abai area case, which is popularly known as Sudan versus SPLM, uh, your oral proceedings at that particular arbitration. Um, Dr. Gary Bond is uh, an honorary professor of law at the University of St. Gallen, Switzerland, and Tsinghua University, Beijing, and currently serves as the president of the Singapore International Arbitration Center, Court of Arbitration. As many of you may know, Dr. Gary Bond is a preeminent authority in the field, and he has been ranked for the past decade as one of the world's leading international arbitration practitioners. Professor Gary is the author of International Commercial Arbitration, which is the leading treatise on the subject. I'm told that the latest edition, the third edition of his book is now available for sale and it is highly recommended that you or your former institute may consider ordering a copy. Um, if I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> this is the first time that you may uh, addressing a Sri Lankan audience, Professor Bourne, and we are so privileged to have you with us today. And I must especially thank uh, Ms. Olga Boltenko. I think, she, I presume that she's also in the audience today who had worked with us on several events and projects uh, for introducing us, for introducing us to Professor Bond and putting in a good word on our behalf. Um, once again, today's session will be moderated by Dr. Asanga Gunawansa. He is the chairman of the International Relations Committee of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Dr. Gunawans accounts for more than 25 years of legal practice and his practice areas are particularly focused on construction and commercial law. And he holds a PhD from the National University of Singapore and an LLM from the University of Warwick on international commercial arbitration. Dr. Gunawans is a member of the arbitral panels of the Asian International Arbitration Center, the Thai Arbitration Center and the SAC uh, Arbitration Council. He is also currently the lead counsel of the Colombo Law Alliance, a law chamber specializing in commercial arbitration and litigation. With that, let me invite Dr. Asanga to commence the proceedings tonight. Over to you, Doctor. Thank you, Janaka, for that very generous uh, introduction. And I would also like to thank Professor Gary Bourne for finding the time to join us today. And I wouldn't want to waste any time because I want the listener to get, listeners to get the maximum benefit from you. So I'm going to invite you to you know, proceed with your lecture and towards the latter part of uh, today's session, when I have enough questions from the listeners, I will moderate the Q&A session and then I hope we can engage in an interesting discussion on some of the issues that arise as a result of pathetic and defective clauses. And one uh, local piece of information that I may want to share with Professor Bourne is that uh, Although arbitration is very, very popular in Sri Lanka, sometimes uh, the local practitioners or uh, maybe even non-legal practitioners in the field have the habit of drafting defective arbitration clauses, which completely derails the process. And we waste a lot of time with preliminary objections before tribunals, 
and then also before courts. So whatever we can learn from you today, I'm sure we'll go a long way in putting things right. So with that, Professor Bond, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Asanga, for that very, that very gracious um, introduction and also Janika um, for, for your very, very kind words. Um, I, I, I too would encourage um, viewers to, to watch the, the ABA arbitration proceedings um, on, on YouTube if one wants to get just a, a sense of what an arbitration looks like in, in real, real practice, a, a truly international arbitration. Both sides' submissions in, in the case were, were highly interesting and one of the benefits of modern technology, even, even before the pandemic, was that you can, you can record um, proceedings and anyone anywhere in the world can, can then watch them. I would also like, though, to, to thank the, the Bar Association for Sri Lanka and, in particular, the International Relations Committee for this opportunity to, to speak with you today. It is indeed, and unfortunately, my first opportunity to address a, a Sri Lankan audience. I think it's one of the deep ironies of the pandemic that we actually seem closer together the further away we, we become. And, this sort of opportunity becomes, becomes more real, more, more possible. With, with those thank yous, and in particular, a, a thank you for the, the participants, the attendees who are, are taking their valuable time to watch, why don't we move to, to the side presentation that, that um, will accompany my, my remarks. My, my remarks, um, of course, concern um, pathological arbitration clauses. It's a term that I'm, I'm sure, as um, Asanga uh, mentioned, is, is familiar in Sri Lanka as it's familiar in, in other parts of the world. The notion that an arbitration clause is, is drafted defectively and therefore is invalid or unenforceable. Um, and as we'll see, there's a long history to to pathological arbitration clauses, and indeed even to that term, pathological arbitration clauses, and we'll look a little bit at that history. The, the basic theme of, of my talk today, though, is that we should put aside that myth, the myth of pathological arbitration clauses, and instead try to reconceive or reconceptualize the topic. What we really ought to be focusing on when there's a badly drafted arbitration clause is not treating it like some monster, some pathological beast, um, but instead trying to fix it, trying to perfect what are at the end of the day, imperfect arbitration agreements. All of us as humans have our own imperfections. Arbitration agreements, unsurprisingly, the product of human drafting also have their imperfections and we are not condemn them because of that, but instead, think about how to fix them. But let's move on to the next slide and, and begin to, to look at the substance of, of my talk with that roadmap of, of where we're going. Businesses around the world, not just in Sri Lanka, uh, corporate draftsmen around the world, again, not just in, in Sri Lanka, have over the last five decades increasingly turned to international commercial, also international investment arbitration to resolve their cross-border commercial disputes. They do so broadly speaking for five reasons, what I call the five E's of international arbitration. And you can see those E's on the current slide. I won't spend a lot of time on these because I know they are familiar to you, but in summary, international arbitration is, although it's never perfect, more efficient than the alternatives and in particular more efficient than national court proceedings. It's more efficient because the parties are able to hand tailor the procedures to particular circumstances of their dispute and because arbitral institutions around the world have developed procedures for fast track arbitration. Also because arbitration doesn't involve endless layers of appellate review. Because it's more efficient, arbitration is also more expeditious and cheaper than the alternatives because, because the proceedings can go quicker because there are not multiple layers of, of review. Arbitration can go quicker and also 
be less expensive than the alternatives. Related to both those two subjects and also evolving out of the basic nature of international arbitration, it is more expert than the alternatives. Parties in arbitration have the freedom, the autonomy to select an arbitrator of their choosing. As a consequence, if they have a construction dispute, they will select construction experts. If they have an insurance dispute, they can select insurance experts. They can choose arbitrators based on the language and the applicable law in the arbitral proceedings. In contrast, national courts involve a one size fits all, take the judge off the shelf arbitrarily um, assignment of, of judges to particular matters. And those judges naturally must be must hear cases involving everything from landlord tenant disputes to administrative law disputes to tax disputes and perhaps occasionally even a construction dispute, which might be what the party's dispute actually can, involves. The parties know better than anyone in the world and have the greatest incentive to select wisely the, an arbitrator based on what exactly their dispute concerns. Arbitration, international arbitration is also more even handed than the alternatives. In, in national courts, parties inevitably desire to proceed in their own home courts. And so frequently one party will sue the other absent an arbitration agreement in its own home turf. Likely in many cases, both parties will do so and one will therefore have parallel proceedings adding of course to the, to the cost of the of the dispute resolution mechanism, parallel proceedings on each party's home ground. In contrast, international arbitration almost always involves a neutral arbitral institution, typically seated in a neutral arbitral seat with a neutral arbitral tribunal, not nationals presiding from either party's home jurisdiction, but instead a truly international, a truly even-handed dispute resolution mechanism. And finally, because of the New York Convention with 166 contracting states around the world and the UNCTRA model law and national arbitration legislation in many jurisdictions around the world, both international arbitration agreements and arbitral awards are more enforceable than national court judgments or choice of court agreements for that matter. Once parties have agreed to arbitrate, they can with confidence go forward knowing that those 166 contracting states will adhere to their commitment under the New York Con Convention to recognize international arbitration agreements. And once the arbitration has been concluded that those states also will recognize and enforce the resulting arbitral award, providing a, a final resolution of the party's dispute. And those five E's are many of the reasons that Parties today, commercial parties, prefer to resolve their disputes by international arbitration. I might also add in this time of the pandemic, a sixth E, international arbitration is more electronic as this webinar demonstrates than national court proceedings. Some national courts have managed to conduct virtual hearings, but in many jurisdictions, there have been difficulties with that, either because jury trials or some other type of local procedural requirement is incompatible with remote hearings, but international arbitration is different. International arbitration has proceeded remotely with tribunals continuing to hear proceedings by, by various virtual platforms and caseloads at arbitral institutions hitting record heights during times of the pandemic. Arbitration has proved more nimble, more flexible, and uh, in part because it is more electronic than the alternatives. And so for those various reasons, international arbitration is very, very frequently selected by commercial parties for good reason to resolve their contractual disputes. Moving on to the next slide. The arbitral process rests, however, as we know, on consent. In order to have an international arbitration, one needs to have an international arbitration agreement. Without the party's consent, in contrast to national courts with mandatory jurisdiction, one cannot have an arbitration. One cannot have a valid arbitral award. Moving on to the next slide. It's therefore essential that in the parties agreement, and then moving again to the, to the next slide, it's therefore essential in order to have a valid arbitration and a valid arbitral award 
that one include in one's commercial contract, a workable arbitration clause, a workable arbitration agreement. One would have thought that this was not a particularly demanding requirement. One would have thought that because many institutions and in UNCITRAL, not really an arbitral institution, but responsible for the UNCITRAL arbitration rules, many arbitral institutions have drafted and published model arbitration clauses, which parties and their legal advisors can include in their commercial contracts. These clauses are not hugely complicated. A good example is on the current slide. It's the UNCITRAL model arbitration clause, and you can see what its text provides. I'll read it just, just for the, the sake of, of clarity, and also to demonstrate how easy it is in many ways to draft a valid arbitration clause. Any dispute, controversy, or claim arising out of or relating to this contract or the breach, termination, or invalidity thereof shall be settled by arbitration in accordance with the UNCITRAL arbitration rules. And then a note, parties should consider adding the appointing authority shall be, and then you name an institution or an appointing person, the number of arbitrators shall be, and, and typically one or three, the place of arbitration shall be, and then a particular location, the language to be used in the arbitral proceedings shall be, and then naturally one adds the language. That's all one needs in order to have a valid arbitration agreement. And if you walk slowly through that model clause, you can see its various components. First, you need, in order to have a good arbitration agreement, you need the scope of the clause. Any dispute, controversy, or claim arising out of or relating to this contract. Relatively broadly drafted scope of the arbitration clause. Then shall be settled by arbitration. A mandatory agreement by the parties that disputes falling within the scope of the clause shall be finally resolved by something called arbitration, not by expert determination, not by mediation or something else, but instead by arbitration, using that magic word in the clause as opposed to some other means of dispute resolution. And in the way that it will be done in accordance with the UNCITRAL arbitration rules. And of course, instead of using those rules, one could use the rules of some arbitral institution, and we'll take a look in a moment at a couple examples to, to that effect. Importantly, parties should, and, and the emphasis here really is on should, and arguably it should be must, um, consider adding several additional points. First, if it's an ad hoc as opposed to an institutional arbitration provision, one should include reference to the appointing authority. Name a particular institution, whether it's the International Chamber of Commerce, whether it's the president of the International Court of Justice, whatever the, the identity of, of one's chosen appointing authority is, if you have an ad hoc arbitration agreement, then one should name the, the appointing authority. Otherwise, one defaults to national courts with the delays and problems that that can, can present. Importantly, one should also name the number of arbitrators. One doesn't have to. There are default rules that operate in the instance that one fails to do so. But typically parties, if they have a major contract, will prefer to specify that there'll be three arbitrators, perhaps for smaller contracts, only a sole arbitrator. However, including a provision with respect to the number of arbitrators adds to the clarity, to the certainty, to the expedition of the arbitral process. Importantly then, one can also identify the place of arbitration. That, as we will see in a few moments, can become critical because without knowing where the place or seat of the arbitration, as it's also called, is, one doesn't know which national courts ultimately will have supervisory authority over the arbitration, including most importantly, with respect to annulment or set aside applications once an award has finally been made. And last, Again, although there are default rules or mechanisms to select the language of the arbitration if the parties have not done so, it is good practice to identify what the language of the arbitration is, whether be it English or Arabic or Spanish or some other language. That is what a good arbitration agreement looks like. 
We can see another example on the next slide of a good arbitration agreement. This is the Singapore International Arbitration Center model clause, and I won't read it out as I did with the UNCITRAL model clause, but if you look at it while I'm speaking on the slide, you can see that it too addresses the scope of the party's agreement to arbitrate. It provides for an unequivocal and mandatory submission of disputes to arbitration. Disputes shall be referred to and finally resolved by arbitration. Provides the means, the procedural mechanism for resolving the dispute in accordance with the SIAC rules for the time being in force. And it also includes provisions with respect to the seat of the arbitration, number of arbitrators, language of the arbitration, and in addition here, a choice of law clause, a choice of law clause with respect to the underlying contract. Let's look at the next slide as well for another example of a reasonably well-drafted arbitration clause, the ICC clause, which in many ways parallels the SIEC clause. All of these clauses can be quite easily used. I typically advise clients to follow the, the motto KISS, K-I-S-S, when drafting arbitration clauses. KISS stands for keep it simple, stupid, because people all too often overcomplicate the task of drafting arbitration clauses. Using a tried and true example from an arbitral institution, whichever one you may prefer, or an ad hoc clause like the UNCITRAL model arbitration clause, takes advantage of the literally generations, decades that have gone into the drafting and redrafting the perfection of model arbitration clauses and it avoids the kind of drafting mistakes that might come from trying to reinvent the arbitration wheel from scratch. Keep it simple and simply use the standard clauses in most cases that arbitral institutions recommend. And if you are going to change the language of those provisions, then do it with the advice of specialized counsel who will have an eye towards what the changes you make to model language may be interpreted subsequently to mean. Let's move to the next slide and start with pathology. We've thus far looked at what a good arbitration clause is. Now let's look at what actually happens in practice, because notwithstanding my advice, notwithstanding the model clauses of many arbitral institutions, corporate lawyers, other lawyers, lay, lay business people frequently don't follow that advice, don't use those clauses, and instead come up with their own versions of arbitration agreements, which when they have defects, as not infrequently they do, are sometimes referred to as pathological arbitration agreement. The word, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, has, has a long history. One of the first secretary generals of the International Chamber of Commerce, Frederick Eisenman, in an article 40 years ago or so, um, described, titled Pathological Arbitration Clauses, described how in order to have a valid arbitration, uh, one needs an arbitration clause that is correctly drafted, and that if it is not, just like an elaborate lighting system will be useless when the power switch fails, so the arbitration agreement will be useless. And he went on, let's continue to the next slide, to explore this concept of the pathological arbitration clause in, in some detail. And it's worth looking at what he said. In terms of arbitration clauses, simplicity appears to be a guarantee of efficiency. And that, to some extent, parallels my advice about keep it simple. But then he went on to say, simplicity is easily transformed into oversimplification it is, if it is not accompanied by rigor. Now, the parties will only find this rigor in experienced lawyers. So Eisenman is saying, in order to have a good arbitration clause, you need experienced and rigorous lawyers. He set a high standard for arbitration agreements. Let's look at the next slide as well. Unfortunately, this high standard that he set for arbitration agreement, agreements often collides with reality. These two pictures, which of course I found on the internet, reflect how arbitration clauses frequently are drafted. Corporate lawyers at the end of what seems like interminable commercial negotiations where they pay attention to the reps and warranties, where they pay attention to the indemnification provisions where they negotiate about delivery terms, where they address everything under the sun, 
only turn to the arbitration agreement, not just at the 11th hour, but at the 11th hour and 59th minute when they're either fully exhausted or fully consumed as the lawyer on the right appears to be with the drafts of prior sections in the contract. And unsurprisingly at the 11th hour, surrounded by other details and in haste to close the transaction, the arbitration agreement usually doesn't get the rigor, the rigorous examination that, that Professor Eisenman thought was essential. Let's move to the next slide, please. And as a consequence, and drawing on his long experience at the International Chamber of Commerce, Eisenman came up with what he called a dark museum of arbitration agreements in which he selected the most characteristic gems. He meant that, I think, ironically or sarcastically, which numerous years in the company of arbitration allowed him to come across, to, to be gathered. And he wondered, he, what he was referring to was his long experience at the ICC, where he had collected what he called defective or pathological arbitration agreements. He created a dark museum of these pathological examples. And he wondered whether these dark, these dark gems were even deserving of the name of arbitration clause, because his, in, in his view, they were so defective, so pathological. Let's move on to the next slide. Before we look at his dark museum, before we look at his pathological monsters, let's recall the basic framework for international arbitration agreements, and we'll do it very briefly. Two principal sources of law with respect to international arbitration agreements, which are important. First, Article 2 of the New York Convention, Article 2.1, requiring contracting states to recognize international arbitration agreements. And then Article 2.3 with a specific remedy, a specific mechanism for enforcing valid arbitration agreements, namely a court where it's seized of a matter that is subject to an international arbitration agreement shall refer the parties to arbitration instead of hearing their dispute itself, unless the agreement is null and void, inoperative, or incapable of being performed basic contract rules, contract law rules with respect to the existence and validity of contracts applicable also to arbitration agreements. And if we move to the next slide, we'll see precisely the same formulation in Article 8 of the UNCTRAL model law and parallel provisions of national arbitration legislation in other jurisdictions. And arbitration agreement in order to be enforceable, in order to require a dispute to be referred to arbitration needs to be valid under generally applicable rules of contract law. Moving to the next slide. Let's look now at Frederick Eisenman's dark museum of pathological arbitration clauses. He began oddly with choice of law clauses. We saw that in one of the examples, the Singapore International Arbitration Center's model arbitration clause. Arbitration agreements are often accompanied by a choice of law agreement, um, specifying the law applicable to the party's underlying contract, often not applicable to their arbitration agreement itself, but the law applicable to their underlying insurance policy, sales contract, joint venture agreement, or what have you. Suppose that that reference, suppose that the choice of law is itself defective in some manner. Eisenman gave a few examples. You can see them on the current slide. For example, one provision provide, that he found said, all disputes must be settled in accordance with the usages of international trade. And another example, which he could have given is, if the parties could not solve the dispute amicably, all disputes and disagreements shall be settled by an arbitration court at the location of the claimant according to the rules of that country governing such proceedings. And then at the very end of the, the clause, the law of the claimant state shall apply to the disputes arising out of the performance of the present contract. Both of these provisions are not desirable choice of law clauses. A, a desirable choice of law clause is relatively straightforward and it simply specifies the law of a particular jurisdiction. This contract shall be governed by the law of Singapore or 
this contract and all disputes arising out of or relating to this contract shall be governed by the laws of Sri Lanka. A relatively straightforward, easily drafted choice of law provision that provides predictability and certainty to the commercial parties. Neither of these two clauses does that very well at all. One refers vaguely to usages of international trade, trade usages being applicable in any event in most cases, and it doesn't specify the law of any particular jurisdiction. The other example is a kind of floating choice of law clause where the choice of the applicable law depends on who the claimant in a particular arbitration is, which fails to provide much certainty at all and leads the parties often to tactical and procedural posturing and gamesmanship. Neither of these two provisions is to be recommended. Neither of these provisions, however, should result in invalidation of the arbitration agreement. It's fundamental that the choice of law clause is not part of the agreement to arbitrate. It's instead an ancillary provision that specifies the law governing the underlying contract. Many contracts don't have choice of law clauses. The validity of the choice of law clause, the existence of a choice of law clause says nothing about the validity and existence of the separate arbitration agreement. One of the basic principles of international arbitration law is the separability of the arbitration agreement from the underlying contract and also from the accompanying choice of law clause. A defect in the choice of law clause, although unwise, although undesirable, does nothing to render the arbitration agreement pathological and any suggestion on the part of Professor Eisenman to the contrary is, is wrong and misconceives the separate character of the arbitration agreement. Let's look at the next slide. A, a little more to the point are arbitration agreements that refer to non-existent arbitral institutions or non-existent institutional arbitration rules. One would find this surprising. Why would corporate draftsmen include a reference in an arbitration agreement or a contract to something that doesn't exist, either never did exist or once did exist, but has since gone out of existence. You would be surprised. You'd be very surprised how frequently, in fact, this happens. And Eisenman gave a couple examples of precisely this. Let's look at the first one. In case of a dispute between the parties for any question relating to this contract, the dispute shall be submitted to arbitration under the rules of the International Arbitration Association applicable in the city of London, England. There is nothing called that. There is no IAA, International Arbitration Association. It never did exist, probably never will exist. That reference is meaningless. And let's look at the next example. All disputes and differences which may arise during the execution of this contract in the event that they cannot be settled amicably shall be submitted to arbitration of the Arbitration Commission sitting at the Paris Chamber of Commerce. The good news is there was a Paris of Chamber of Commerce. And the bad news is it never had an arbitration commission nor an arbitration commission sitting at that Chamber of Commerce. Again, a reference to a non-existent arbitral institution. And another example further on in the slide to the, a similar kind of defective reference. And let's move to the next slide. And I won't, I won't belabor this point, but one would be surprised at how frequently and indeed how creatively parties come up with names for non-existent arbitral institutions. Let's look at the next slide. Eisenman thought that these references were pathological and that they do not deserve to be cured. He thought that when the parties included a reference to a non-existent institution, it was such a pathology, such a defect that the arbitration agreement itself was invalid, hence the name pathological. Let's move to the next slide. The better view, however, is to the contrary. The better view, which has been adopted by both arbitral awards and national court decisions all around the world, is not to take such a harsh, such an unforgiving approach towards imperfections in arbitration agreements. Instead, it is 
to adopt one of two approaches to those kinds of defective arbitration agreements. One approach is to try to interpret those clauses and give meaning to the incorrect reference to an arbitral institution. And let's look at that particular approach here. The, uh, an award made in the Zurich Chamber of Commerce, uh, in the Zurich Chamber of Commerce arbitration reasoned as follows. An international trade association in Zurich, and then the tribunal noted there is none, means arbitration under the Zurich Chamber of Commerce international arbitration rules, which did exist. Basically, what this tribunal did was to say the parties made a mistaken reference to something that didn't exist, International Trade Association in Zurich, but there is something rather similar to that reference, namely the Zurich Chamber of Commerce International Arbitration Rules, which we conclude reasonable parties must have intended. Give meaning to a mistaken reference. It's a little bit like a, a, an arbitration clause that might refer to the Singapore International Arbitration Commission. There isn't one instead of the Singapore International Arbitration Center. An, a, a court, an arbitral tribunal would simply correct the mistaken reference rather than treating it as a pathology that doesn't deserve to be cured. And the same thing, a similar kind of approach was adopted, but with an important difference in the US court decision that's listed at the bottom of the slide. It reasoned an agreement on a non-existent arbitration forum is the equivalent of an agreement to arbitrate which does not specify a forum or an arbitral institution. Since the parties had the intent to arbitrate even in the absence of a properly designated forum or institution. Instead of trying to fix or correct the party's mistake in reference, what this court did was say, we'll simply blue pencil that reference out. We will delete it. And what we'll be left with then is an ad hoc arbitration agreement. So if the parties agreed, for example, looking at the, the first example on the slide to arbitrate before an international trade association in Zurich, the, the court would have, instead of referring the parties to the Zurich Chamber of Commerce International Arbitration Rules, instead provided for ad hoc arbitration in Zurich. Either one of these approaches is, is a, a plausible approach, a, a credible approach, one of those approaches should be adopted instead of the harsh view that Eisenman took of simply invalidating a defectively drafted arbitration agreement. Let's look at the next slide. Some slides, some arbitration agreements fail to define the scope of the arbitration um, agreement in the way that the institutional arbitration rules that we saw did. You can see some examples here in the, the current slide. And these are, these are real life examples. These are, are provisions that parties actually included in, in contracts. Arbitration to be settled in London was all that their contract said. No reference to arbitration of what, no reference to what category or categories of disputes would be referred to arbitration. Another example would be arbitration Hamburg. Some, some types of contracts, commodity shipping contracts, occasionally insurance agreements, have this sort of shorthand reference where there's trade usage or industry practice that, that involves the use of arbitration and parties don't specify in any detail what exactly it is they're arbitrating. And then a, a similar example in the third, third bullet point on the slide. Let's move to the, to the next slide though. Most tribunals and most national courts have given effect to these types of provisions, even though it's unwise to draft an arbitration agreement with an undefined scope. Tribunals here, here, here the, the highest court in Austria concluded an arbitral tribunal can only decide disputes arising from defined legal relationships and not from undefined legal relationships. And let's look at the next slide. Um, which, which led um, at least some courts to invalidate those types of provisions saying, well, just an, a, a general agreement to arbitrate anything in the world um, is invalid. But most courts have adopted a different view. Most courts have instead tried to give a reasonable interpretation to a naked reference to arbitration that it impliedly contains limits, limits of 
disputes relating to the contract in which that arbitration provision occurs, and that parties are free to use that sort of shorthand reference. Again, it's unwise to draft an arbitration clause without defining the scope, but there's no reason that that should invalidate the arbitration agreement, turn it into some sort of pathological monster. Another example of a defectively drafted arbitration agreement are internally contradictory arbitration agreements. And you can see a good example on the current slide. The provision which Eisenman had found in the ICC archives says, in case of dispute, acceptance of jurisdiction of an international arbitration to be granted by the Chamber of Commerce International of Paris following all rules of said international judge. Just on its own, that might be a very badly drafted arbitration agreement, but it's not yet um, contradictory. It's a badly drafted arbitration agreement because it's not really clear what acceptance of jurisdiction means. Um, it's not clear what international arbitration to be granted by the Chamber of Commerce International of Paris is. It's not clear whether the reference to Paris is the seat of the arbitration or something else. And so it's um, at very best, um, a poorly drafted arbitration agreement. Um, but then to make matters worse, these parties went on to add the next paragraph as well. This agreement shall be construed, interpreted, and enforced in accordance with the laws of Italy, the choice of law clause buried in the middle of their arbitration agreement. And then the place to sue shall be Paris, France, in accordance with the above specified rules of international commercial arbitration. The Eisenman thought that that could well be a choice of court clause. And one does see other provisions in practice where parties include both a choice of court and an arbitration clause. And in his view, that made the arbitration clause defective. If you both agree to arbitrate and also agree to litigate, you haven't really agreed to do anything. Let's look at the next clause on the next slide. Here's some additional examples along the lines of what I just mentioned. For example, look at the, the second bullet point. Any dispute shall be adjudicated upon under the ICC rules of arbitration. And that's bad enough for some of the reasons I mentioned on the previous slide. And then to go on and say, the courts of England shall have exclusive jurisdiction, a choice of court clause together with an arbitration clause. And you can see exactly the same thing in the somewhat longer clause at the top of the page. Let's move to the next slide. And Eisenman considered that this type of reference to a combination of an ad hoc arbitration and the rules of an arbitral institution providing for two different types of arbitration or also a reference to a choice of court clause and to an international arbitration agreement is internally contradictory, therefore pathological, and therefore null and void and ineffective. Let's move to the next slide. However, most courts today, most arbitral tribunals take a different view. When, and it's worth looking at the reasoning of, of this decision, when there's a variance, a difference between the two arbitration agreements, and it is an ancillary logistical concern, not integral to the underlying agreement to arbitrate, that does not preclude arbitration. Let's look at the next slide to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, um, let's before we before we look at this provision, though. Let's let's close the loop on internally contradictory arbitration provisions. Most courts today have tried to reconcile the differences between contradictory provisions in arbitration agreements. And let me give you some examples of how that's done. If, as Eisenman suggests, a clause has references to two different institutions, for example, this arbitration shall be conducted by the ICC and the Singapore International Arbitration Center, a reference to two different arbitral institutions, which can't both administer the same arbitration. What courts have done, what arbitral tribunals and institutions have done, is try to reconcile those provisions. And so they've interpreted one reference to an institution as selecting the institutional arbitration rules. 
for example, the Singapore International Arbitration Center rules. And the reference to the other institution, the ICC, as an appointing authority to select the arbitrator to function other the other institution's rules. And many institutions have cooperated together to make sense out of contradictory clauses in that fashion. Equally, courts have interpreted references to arbitration agreements and choice of court provisions as doing the following, not saying you can either arbitrate or litigate, but instead saying you will arbitrate, but the court with supervisory jurisdiction shall be the court that's specified in the arbitration agreement to decide such things as challenges to arbitrators, judicial assistance in aid of the arbitration, provisional measures in aid of arbitration, and most importantly, annulment of the ultimate arbitral award, making sense out of the apparently contradictory provisions in the party's arbitration agreement, instead of treating it as pathological and therefore defective. One might also imagine, going back to something we talked about a few moments ago, that if you have references to two arbitral institutions who can't or won't cooperate with each other, then simply deleting both those references and leaving the parties with an ad hoc arbitration agreement in the arbitral speed that they have specified. Let's look at another example of a pathological arbitration clause. This is an optional or a non-mandatory arbitration clause. Suppose that your arbitration agreement, instead of providing that all disputes shall be resolved by arbitration pursuant to the ICC or the SIC rules, provides any party may, not shall or must, but may submit the dispute to binding arbitration. Or alternatively, and even more pointedly, what if the arbitration agreement provides that upon mutual agreement of the parties here too, disputes may be resolved by arbitration? Let's look at the next slide. Or a couple other examples of supposedly optional arbitration agreements, arbitration, if any, in New York, uh, in Paris, or arbitration, if required, in New York. And let's move to the next slide. All of these provisions suggest that the arbitration agreement isn't binding, that the parties specify the possibility of arbitration in the future, but that before that, that possibility becomes binding, becomes mandatory, a further agreement, mutual agreement by the parties is, is required. That type of language is, is undesirable. One ought not to suggest that arbitration is simply an option available if both parties agree in the future. One ought instead to use the language of institutional arbitration clauses that are published on their websites. But if one does use that sort of arguably optional language, then this judgment, a privy council judgment, makes the better treatment, provides the better treatment of those kinds of provisions. A, a, an optional arbitration clause, for example, either party may submit a dispute to arbitration, should be regarded as not requiring either party to submit a dispute to arbitration. Instead, they can try to resolve the dispute through negotiations, try to settle the dispute. But, and then this is the important part in the analysis, if either party does avail itself of that option, does submit a dispute to arbitration, then the other party is bound to arbitrate and importantly, not to litigate. Either party is free to start a litigation and if the other party wishes to litigate, it may do so, waiving its rights under the arbitration agreement, but either party has the, the option, the right to commence an arbitration. And once it does so, the other party is then bound by its commitment to resolve disputes by arbitration. That gives sensible commercial meaning to arbitration agreements that include that type of, of language. Let's move on to the next slide. Finally, there are examples of indefinite or uncertain arbitration clauses, which are drafted so badly that it's difficult to figure out what exactly they mean. Let's look at a couple examples. All disputes arising out of this contract shall in the first instance be submitted to arbitration. And then the arbitrator will be a renowned chamber of commerce, as the International Chamber of Commerce, 
jointly designated by the buyer and seller. There are so many mistakes with this provision, it's difficult to figure out where to begin. Um, the first mistake, though, is that it refers to disputes being in the first instance submitted to arbitration. That suggests that there's a second instance or a final instance, that if you don't like what happens in the arbitration, well, that was just the first instance, and you're free to go to national courts to ultimately have your dispute resolved. That type of interpretation, that type of approach makes no sense given the objectives of arbitration being, as we saw, to provide an efficient, expeditious, and enforceable means of dispute resolution. One ought to avoid language that talks about disputes being submitted in the first instance to arbitration. Instead, provide that disputes will be finally resolved by arbitration. Second, the arbitrator will be a renowned chamber of commerce. That is hopelessly unclear. What does it mean to choose a renowned chamber of commerce? Which chambers of commerce are renowned and which aren't and in whose opinion? And then just to make matters worth, jointly designated by the buyer and the seller, implying that perhaps requiring that any selection of an arbitral institution um, ultimately be a product of joint agreement. And if the parties don't agree, then there is no selection of an arbitral institution. And finally, just to make matters hopelessly conf confused, note that the, the provision says the arbitrator, not the arbitral institution, the arbitrator will be a renowned chamber of commerce. Arbitral institutions aren't arbitrators. Arbitral institutions select arbitrators. And thus, this clause, which Eisenman included in his Dark Museum of Pathological Clauses, indeed was highly uncertain, highly indefinite. He gave another example, and let's just go through it very quickly. All disputes arising out of this contract should be settled through negotiation and amicable settlement. If this metal method of settlement proves impracticable, whatever that means, the contentious issues will be settled according to the rules of conciliation and arbitration, both of them, of the ICC in Paris, by one or more arbitrators appointed in accordance with these rules. In the event that the arbitral proceedings fail to settle the matter for any reason whatsoever, the judicial court of which the disputing party would apply will rule on the dispute on the basis of the law. Um, again, um, multiple defects in this provision, unclear when um, negotiation and amicable settlement might prove impracticable, unclear what the scope of the provision, what are contentious issues might be. Finally, um, like some of the provisions that we saw previously, the suggestion that arbitral proceedings are simply the first instance and then that either party can go to whichever judicial court in the world it wishes to rule on the dispute, to actually decide the dispute de novo. Both provisions quite unwise. Nobody ought to draft an arbitration clause that looks like either of these. Let's look at the next slide. And let's actually skip over this particular slide. It's just another example um, of, of a pathological provision and look at the next slide in, instead. And this is how courts today, in contrast to, to Professor Eisenman, um, have, have approached um, indefinite or uncertain arbitration clauses, which one does encounter, un unfortunately, in practice, where one term of an arbitration agreement has failed. The decision between substituting a new term for the failed provision and refusing to enforce the agreement turns on the intent of the parties at the time the agreement was executed. To determine this intent, parties look to the essence of the arbitration agreement. To the extent the court can infer that the essential term of the provision is the agreement to arbitrate, the agreement will be enforced despite the failure of one of the terms of the bargain. This is a general approach that arbitral tribunals and courts around the world have, have adopted. Even if there's a defective provision or defective provisions in the plural in the arbitration agreement, courts will tend to ignore those provisions, blue pencil them out or try to interpret them to mean something sensible. And then importantly, give effect to what's left in the arbitration agreement. So to go back to some of the examples we looked at previously, 
where there is a reference to both a national court and the arbitral tribunal, courts will try to interpret those harmoniously, try to interpret the arbitration agreement as an agreement to resolve disputes by arbitration with the reference to national courts being to supervisory authority and annulment power, where there's a requirement that the, the parties jointly agree on a particular chamber of commerce as the arbitrator, courts will interpret that as giving the parties the option to agree on arbitral institution to appoint an arbitrator. But if they can't agree, then enforcing the parties ad hoc arbitration agreement in the specified arbitral seat. And that all makes perfect commercial sense. It perfects imperfect arbitration agreements, just as sensible commercial parties would intend. Let's look at the next slide. Sometimes one comes across what are called blank or bare or naked arbitration clauses. And Professors Gaillard and Savage in their book on French arbitration law address this subject as follows. A blank clause is one which contains no indication whether directly or by reference to arbitration rules as to how the arbitrators are to be appointed and about the place or seat of the arbitration. In French domestic arbitration law, such clauses will be held ineffective. Put differently, a blank arbitration clause that doesn't specify how you appoint the arbitrators or the seat or place of arbitration is held ineffective. And the reason for that, it is said, is straightforward. If the arbitration clause simply says the parties agree to arbitrate, but doesn't say how you choose the arbitrators and doesn't specify the seat of the arbitration, then you don't know how unless the parties agree to select the arbitrators. The parties don't incorporate institutional arbitration rules who, if they had, could select an arbitrator, an arbitral tribunal, and they don't specify a seat of the arbitration to whose national courts you could go to appoint the arbitrators. The blank clause is too uncertain, too indefinite to be given effect, at least it is said. Let's move to the next slide. And it's another example of a blank arbitration clause that simply contains an agreement to arbitrate without specifying any arbitral institution in the institutional rules and without specifying a place or seat of the arbitration. Next slide. And you can imagine even shorter arbitration clauses. These I, I, I used from some prior examples that we saw, that they are what I would call the world's shortest arbitration clause. It simply says in the party's contract, arbitration. You strike out the references to what might be the seat Hamburg or London, and you're left with a blank arbitration clause, which in the view referred to by Professor Gaillard and Professor, Professor Savage um, would, would be invalid as a bare or a blank arbitration agreement. Let's move to the next slide. I mean, let's, this, this um, is a Hong Kong decision, which involved um, also um, what ultimately was a blank arbitration clause. And it's a little bit of a review session for what I've talked about already. Any dispute or difference arising out of or relating to this contract or the breach thereof, which cannot be settled amicably without undue delay by the interested parties shall be arbitrated in the third country under the rules of that third country and in accordance with the rules of procedure of the International Commercial Arbitration Association. Again, there are many things we now know, having, having listened, looked at the, the previous clauses, there are many things wrong with this, this clause. Um, there's an indefinite reference to negotiation before arbitration, cannot be settled amicably without undue delay. What does that mean? Is there a reference to a seat of the arbitration? Not really. The interested parties um, shall arbitrate in the third country. What's the third country? We don't even know what the first and the second countries are, so it's pretty hard to figure out what the third country is. We might figure, though, if you look at the names of the parties in this case, being a dispute between a Hong Kong and a Korean party, 
we might figure that the first and the second countries are Hong Kong and Korea, and therefore that the third country is somewhere else. That's not quite a blank clause. Instead of 200 possible arbitral seats, it's 198 possible arbitral seats. It's not blank, but it might as well be blank given how uncertain it is. But wait, isn't there a reference there to an institutional arbitration mechanism? The rules of procedure of the International Commercial Arbitration Association. That's our arbitral institution. And so its rules must provide a means for selecting the arbitral tribunal. Once you've selected the arbitral tribunal, it can, using its default authority, select the arbitral seat. You don't have a blank clause. It's not drafted all that well, but at least arguably, you've got an institutional arbitration clause that doesn't specify a seat, but where the arbitral tribunal can be chosen and then itself choose the arbitral seat. That would be a promising line of inquiry, but it's wrong because there is no such thing as the International Commercial Arbitration Association. It doesn't exist, it never did exist as the Hong Kong Court of First Instance concluded. Does that defect, a reference to a non-existent arbitral institution, invalidate the arbitration clause? No, by way of review, and as we saw previously, it doesn't. You blue pencil that out or alternatively interpret it to mean some arbitration institution which does exist. There's probably no equivalent to something like the International Commercial Arbitration Association. So what the Hong Kong court did in this case, Lucky Gold Star, was to blue pencil out that reference. That prevents the clause from being defective for that reason, but is it defective then for some other reason, namely, because it's a blank clause, because as we saw a few moments ago, it refers to 198 possible arbitral seats and it doesn't anymore provide a means of selecting the arbitral tribunal. The lucky gold star court, the Hong Kong court concluded that that was not an invalid arbitration clause. It concluded that in fact, what this provision did was give either party the option of selecting the arbitral seat in a third country, a third country of its choice. So neither party could choose either Korea or Hong Kong, those being the first and the second countries. Instead, they had to choose when they were going to commence an arbitration, a third country as the arbitral seat. But once they chose a jurisdiction to go forward in, that choice would be binding on the counterparty. And as a consequence, the lucky gold star court in a very far-sighted, very insightful decision upheld this arbitration agreement. Frederick Eisenman wouldn't have done that. He would have put this in his dark museum and treated it as a pathological monster, a dark gem to be condemned because it lacked the rigor that an arbitration clause should have. He's correct in part, it certainly does lack rigor, but he's incorrect in treating it as a dark monster. Instead, the Hong Kong court treated it properly as an imperfect agreement that required some care some loving in order to be remedied, to be perfected and therefore made operative. Let's move to the next slide. And you can see here the reasoning of the Hong Kong court on the current slide. He had, the Hong Kong judge had no doubt that the party's dominant intention was to resolve disputes, to settle disputes by arbitration rather than to specify a particular means or instrumentality of how the arbitration was to be conducted. And thus he gave effect to the party's dominant intention being to arbitrate, even if that turned out to be ad hoc arbitration in a seat chosen by the claimant in the arbitration. And let's move on to the next slide. And I think that provides a, a good ending point for our, our discussion. Uh, there are many types of allegedly pathological arbitration agreements. We've looked at some, trust me, there are many others. Um, those provisions though, and if we move on to the next slide, don't deserve to be categorized as lacking, not deserving the name of an arbitration clause or being put into some sort of dark museum. Instead, moving on to the next slide, those provisions deserve to, to be perfected. And you can see a number of 
decisions here, one by the Swiss Federal Tribunal that do precisely that, refuse to invalidate arbitration agreements, even though there's an imprecise or flawed designation of the arbitral tribunal, instead seeking to give, attempt to the funda give effect to the fundamental intent of the parties to submit to arbitral jurisdiction. And the same type of reasoning on the next slide, following the Swiss Federal Tribunal, um, a decision by a Singaporean court. And so, so long as the arbitration can be carried out without prejudice to the rights of either party, and so long as giving effect to such intention does not result in an arbitration that is not within the contemplation of either party, the clause will be given effect, even if it's ambiguous, inconsistent, incomplete, or lacking certain particulars. Now, that's not to say that one should ignore the keep it simple advice. One, one ought not to draft pathological clauses, but if one encounters them equally, one ought not to condemn them as pathologies. Instead, one ought to undertake the task of perfecting what inevitably in life is an imperfect effort by imperfect people. And I hope with that, with that summary of pathologies, but also remedies, um, we've, we've come to the end of this presentation. I'd be more than happy to discuss um, any questions, uh, respond to any questions that, that the attendees may have. Thank you, Professor. Over to you, Dr. Asan Gunawans. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bond, for that very insightful and um, educational uh, presentation. And I'm sure the audience thoroughly enjoyed your presentation today and learned, learned a lot. And I can confirm I had a few questions of my own, but then uh, from the audience, we have received about you know good 10 questions. So I'm going to put those to you. And to start with, the, the first question I have is, uh, it goes like this, it says, where the arbitration clause purpose to create two parallel dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, for example, arbitration and courts having exclusive jurisdiction. Can I, as the respondent, successfully object to arbitral jurisdiction in the event of a dispute? That's a good question. And it's one um, that I, I think you will all recall we touched on um, briefly in, in some of the slides. Uh, an arbitration clause that, that provides all disputes shall be finally resolved by arbitration. And then immediately thereafter, a provision that the courts of a particular location shall have exclusive jurisdiction or alternatively, um, all disputes shall be resolved in the courts of um, a specified um, country. Um, and the question is, can I, in, if I have that provision in the contract, refuse to arbitrate and therefore instead litigate in the, the chosen forum. One can certainly make that argument. One can certainly say that this provision contemplates either arbitration or national court litigation and one is free to pick and choose that the claimant can select one or, or the other. In my view, as suggested in my previous comments, that's not the better way to harmonize those two provisions. I think that um, ultimately reduces the arbitration clause to having virtually no meaning. And most national courts, I think, have reached that same conclusion. They've instead interpreted the arbitration agreement as an agreement to arbitrate disputes related to the party's contract. And the reference to national courts as being the national courts of the arbitral seat. That is to say, those courts which are specified in, in the arbitration provision will hear judicial matters related to the arbitration. And that means annulment, most importantly. It also means challenges to, to arbitrators where that's possible under national law, the replacement of arbitrators, um, judicial assistance in aid of the arbitral process. That, in, in my view, gives better effect to those two provisions which are clearly in tension with one another. One what ought not to draft a provision along these lines, but I think the better way to interpret them 
is that the selection of national courts is not to provide a parallel means of dispute resolution, but instead to provide courts to support the arbitral process. Clearly though, um, and it depends ultimately in part on the language of the party's agreement, clearly there is scope to argue that um, in fact parties, oddly, bizarrely, chose to have two parallel mechanisms for dispute resolution. Uh, thank you, Professor Bourne. And also there is another very interesting question. Um, the question goes like this. Will court usually also receive evidence other than looking at the arbitration agreement itself to salvage a defective arbitration agreement? That's a great, that's a great question. And, and I, the answer, of course, depends on, on local civil procedure and, and evidence rules in, in different countries. Um, in many countries, though, particularly if you have an ambiguous um, provision, then extraneous evidence bearing on the party's intentions would, would be admissible. In, that's certainly true in many common law jurisdictions, and, and I suspect it's true in, in most civil law jurisdictions as well. If you have an absolutely clear-cut contract, perhaps the court won't admit evidence to try to interpret what the plain language rather evidently means, but we're in a, a different um, fact pattern here. We're in a situation where the arbitration agreement is allegedly pathological, where it appears to be ambiguous or uncertain or indefinite. And therefore, most courts would allow what's called extraneous or parole evidence in order to ascertain the party's um, subjective intentions in some cases, or alternatively to shed light on what their objective intentions should be. Uh, a related question to that, Professor Bond, because now in most um, in most commercial contracts, there will be a clause uh, trying to uh, prevent the parties from relying on uh, parallel evidence when it comes to interpreting the contract. So basically, there will be a whole of contract clause which says that everything the concerning the rights and obligations of the parties will be contained in the contract itself and nowhere nowhere else. And then you have the arbitration clause, which is of course a standalone arbitration clause. But if the arbitration clause is defective in order to try to cure that, if the court is trying to look at uh, extreme, uh, external evidence, it may be email communications or letters of exchange, you know, and things like that between the parties, uh, how would they deal with that when there is a preventive clause in the main contract? Yeah. So those types of entire agreement provisions are, are as, you, as you rightly know, quite standard. You frequently encounter them in at least, at least larger commercial, commercial contracts. It's, it's um, fairly normal. I don't want to say boilerplate, but it's fairly normal standard terms and, and conditions. Um, so a couple thoughts. Again, it depends, of course, on, on national law in particular jurisdictions. English law might be different from Peruvian might be different from Sri Lankan, might be different from Indian law. Um, and you could have different approaches in, in different jurisdictions. Um, broadly speaking, I, I would suggest two, two points. First, um, I would suggest that the entire agreement provision um, doesn't, doesn't forbid reliance on extrinsic evidence in order to determine what the terms of the underlying contract are. Um, when one's not trying to add a new term or um, impose a collateral obligation of some sort, but instead to understand what the language of the contract means, you don't violate the intent of the entire agreement clause. In fact, you give effect to it um, by admitting evidence to interpret it in cases where it's ambiguous or uncertain. I would also, and I think, um, I think you alluded to, to this line of argument, I would also suggest that the entire agreement clause doesn't really apply to the arbitration clause because it is separable. The entire agreement clause um, provide, applies to the underlying contract, not to the separable arbitration agreement, and particularly not in circumstances where its meaning is, is unclear. Just to take an extreme example, suppose going back to, to a hypothetical that I posed during during the slide presentation, suppose that the party's contract, the final contract that they sign, provides for arbitration under the Singapore International Arbitration Commission. 
but then in the emails that led up to that final contract, there had been multiple references to the Singapore International Arbitration Center, and there was simply a mistake in trans transcription um, when when um, the final contract came to be to be um, drafted. I would think in those circumstances there would be a very compelling argument that the entire agreement um, provision didn't prevent reliance on that sort of um, extrinsic evidence. Thank you, Professor Bourne. Uh, that is also uh, another question that has come. I think you dealt with this aspect in the last few slides, but for purposes of clarity, I will relay the question in case if there is some confusion among the uh, listeners, any particular person who raised this question. So the question goes like this. It says, why is specifying the law governing the arbitration clause uh, necessary? Isn't specifying which institutional rules apply sufficient? Hmm. That's, a, that's, a, that's a fair question. Um, so typically, um, commercial contracts contain two related provisions. And we touched on this during the, the slide presentation. First, they will have an arbitration agreement or sometimes a choice of court agreement. That specifies the procedure for, for resolving disputes. And second, they will have a choice of law clause that specifies the law governing the underlying contract. Um, Turning more directly to the question, there are sometimes arguments that the choice of law clause for the underlying contract also selects the law governing the arbitration agreement. In my view, that, that analysis is incorrect. The choice of law clause should be considered to select the law governing the underlying contract, but it ought not to address procedural matters, including in particular the procedures for dispute resolution and the separable arbitration agreement. And, and, and many practitioners agree with that. And you therefore sometimes see provisions in the arbitration agreement itself that specifically select the law applicable to that agreement. Um, for example, a provision that would say this arbitration agreement shall be governed by the law of X. In my view, that is unnecessary because in selecting the arbitral seat, parties should be held to have also selected the law of the arbitral seat to apply to their arbitration agreement, to have done so impliedly. I don't think it hurts necessarily to select the law governing the arbitration agreement specifically in the arbitration agreement, um, but it is unnecessary. I should, in, in sort of continuing in answering this question, which which actually raises a number of issues, selecting the rules of an arbitral institution will not ordinarily select either the law governing the underlying contract or the law governing the arbitration agreement. That is because most institutional rules do not include within them selection of the substantive law governing the underlying contract. Sometimes there will be a choice of law standard Many institutional rules provide that if the parties select the law governing the underlying contract, then the arbitral tribunal shall apply that law. And they also sometimes have a conflicts of laws formulation. The arbitral tribunal shall apply that law, which it considers applicable. But virtually never do institutional rules contain a default choice of substantive law governing the underlying contract. And therefore, if the parties want to choose the law governing the underlying contract, they should do so explicitly in a choice of law clause. And if you'll remember the Singapore International Arbitration Center model clause has a, a good choice of law provision for the underlying contract. Occasionally, institutional rules may have in them, and I think Hong Kong and, and the LCIA are examples of this, may have in them default choices of law for the arbitration agreement itself, but most institutional rules do not do so. And therefore, when you select most institutional arbitration rules, you do not thereby select a default choice of law for the arbitration agreement. And again, if you wish to do so, you need to do that separately. Although, as I also said, specifying the seat is usually good enough. 
Thank you, uh, Professor Bowen. I think we are running out of time, but there are like a couple of uh, questions, if I may put to them very quickly for a quick response. Um, okay. One question has just come in. Um, <laughs> it, it, it reads like that it is from one of our participants from India, and he wants to find out what do you think about the Arbitration Act of India, whether it is in line with the requirement of the international business community, or do you think that it requires any additional amendments or any other judicial reforms required? Uh, so I don't know whether you are familiar with the Arbitration Act of India, but are you in a position to respond to that? So I, I, I know the Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996 with, with its various amendments, including I think amendments just last month or this month even, um, um, reasonably well, albeit from, from a foreign um, perspective. And this may be a, a Sri Lankan presentation, but I'm sure we have lots of, of neighbors also attending. I think, in fact, the, the Indian Act um, is in, in some respects um, a, a real improvement on, on previous legislation. And I think the Indian Supreme Court has taken some, some quite important steps um, over um, the last decade in interpreting the act, the Balco decision um, in, in particular, I think um, brought India much more into line with the international business community and frankly also India's obligations under, under the New York Convention. If I understand correctly, recent amendments have, have also um, addressed some important concerns um, of, of um, the international community. Um, again, from, from a foreign perspective, my understanding was that, that um, a couple of years ago, there were amendments to, to the act that, that might have been understood as, as requiring that arbitrators in Indian ar seated arbitrations be both Indian qualified and Indian nationals. I think that would have been um, quite significantly out of step with with um, international arbitration expectations, international business expectations. But I also understand um, that recent amendments um, corrected that. Um, um, there, there may well be others who are, are better informed than, than I am on this topic. But I think with that, assuming that correction has occurred, then I think India has made very significant steps in, in um, a constructive direction. Uh, thank you, Professor Bond. My last question, I promise, you know, for you tonight. Uh, I'm going to slightly uh, twist it a little bit so that there is clarity in the question. This relates to uh, tiered arbitration clauses. And the question is, when there is a tiered dispute resolution clause providing different mechanisms of dispute resolution and ultimately ending in arbitration, does the entire dispute resolution clause uh, considered as a separate clause from the underlying main agreement? So that's a good question. Um, and I'll, I'll try to be brief with this, with this last. Uh, Professor uh, Bond, did you get my question? Yes, I did. Um, yes, I did. Can you hear me? Um, yes, I, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, OK, you. good. OK, we so. We can hear you. You can hear me? No, we can hear you, Professor, clearly. OK, no good. Yeah. OK, good. Um, so um, that's a good yes. question. Multi, and, and I'll, I'll try to be brief with my final answer. Um, Multi-tier dispute resolution provisions are not uncommon. Um, businesses like the idea that first, for a specified period of time, you try to negotiate. Failing that, perhaps for another specified period of time, you try to conciliate. Failing that either party is free to go to arbitration. Um, it's called a, a, a multi-tier dispute resolution um, provision because there are different tiers of dispute resolution. Um, in my view, that is indeed a, um, all part of the arbitration agreement and all um, separable from the underlying um, contract. Importantly though, and this will be my final comment, I think great caution must be used in um, in adopting these types of, of multi-step, multi-tier um, dispute resolution provisions because disputes, including importantly jurisdictional disputes can arise out of them. Parties frequently say that, well, 
there wasn't sufficient negotiation. We didn't negotiate in good faith for the entire cooling off period that was specified, or we didn't conciliate in good faith. And as a consequence, when you started the arbitration, um, it was premature. You gun jumped. Um, you began the arbitration without having fully completed the prior steps, and therefore your request for arbitration was invalid. Put in a different way, the arbitration wasn't conducted in accordance with the party's um, procedural agreement, which is a, a ground for non-recognition of an award under Article 5.1.D, a ground for annulment of an award under the model law, Article 34.2.A.4. Um, and um, those, are, those are indeed serious jurisdictional problems. And as a consequence, I counsel typically against multi-step dispute resolution mechanisms. I think you're on mute. Doctor, I think you're mute. Doctor Sanger? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. I think you uh, Professor Gary Bond, thank you very much for spending your time today with us and for this very valuable lecture. Uh, I'm sure all our participants, more than approximate, I think more than 200 signed up today uh, through YouTube and also through the link that we have provided. Everybody benefited immensely from it. I certainly did. And, and there were a lot of junior lawyers attached to my chamber who were following it, and I'm sure all of them and including uh, the, the uh, other members from the Bar Association signing in, and also uh, other lawyers and legal practitioners from the region who signed up, you know, certainly benefited from this. So thank you very much. And we hope that we can again have a, uh, another session on a, perhaps um, you know, another interesting topic with you in the, in the new year. I would also like to thank uh, uh, President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, Mr. Kalinga, Inter President's Council, for all the support and encouragement given to the International Relations Committee uh, in conducting this webinar and all the other programs that we have had throughout the year. And similarly, I would like to thank the Secretary of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, Mr. Rajiv Amaru Surya, for his support, and Mr. Pasindu Silva from the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, also for his support and all the technical guidance given to us in conducting these webinars. And then the fellow members of my International Relations Committee uh, who have been working very hard throughout this year, despite the challenges that we have faced due to the COVID-19 situation and, and various lockdowns you know, in, in, in Sri Lanka and the region. Uh, Ms. Mrs. Champika Amrasekara, Ms. Sanrudha Pereira throughout the year. And we would also like to thank Professor Bond's staff, uh, Catherine Fratch and Marta uh, Valtellini for all their support in making this event a success. And finally, I would also like to thank all our listeners for joining in. I would like to wish all of you a very happy first new season. Stay safe and let's hope for a better year ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And thank you for the opportunity to participate. I look forward thank you, to the session. Have a pleasant evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>